Um, and I'm going to go ahead and kick off and welcome you to uh, From Plan to Action, Bring Your Strategy to Life. Uh, our strategy activation webinar, this is the first in a series of two. Um, so this webinar's intention is really to, to share with you some of uh, the best practices that we've observed around how do you bring strategy to life? How do you, from the point you've got a strategy, how do you make it real in an organization? Um, this first webinar is going to be largely focused on uh, the, the sort of theory and the practice of what we've seen, what we've observed, and the best practices and some principles that you can take away to start applying today, hopefully in your work. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll tell you about the second webinar as well, which is going to be much more hands-on, actually talking about some tools, some things that you can actually use, some, some structured approaches. So um, I'm welcoming you. I'm really glad that you're here, and thank you for sharing your time, particularly for those of you that are so far away in a different time zone. Much appreciated on a Friday. Let me share a little. We've been around for about 25 years. Uh, we've had the experience over the last 25 years of working with Fortune 500 companies, large organizations, and small organizations all around the world. And our focus has principally been, how do we actually take your ideas and explain them so that they can be understood and activated in the world? In terms of what our, where our focus of our work is, we sit at the intersection of strategy, culture, and design. If strategy is really the topic for today, what we want to emphasize is that your strategy is a plan. Your strategy is a way to move forward in the organization, to envision a future, and a way to actually bring it to life. What we also recognize is that organizations or cultures are made up of people. So for a strategy to actually be activated, we need to understand that organizations are really organisms and they're made up of human beings who need to understand the what, the why, the how, and the what's in it for me. And this is where design comes into our practice. From the design practice, we, we try to bridge these two things. We try to bring together the idea that we have a strategy that we want to execute. We have a group of humans that we need to get aligned and understanding and moving forward in the same direction. And by leveraging human-centered design, by leveraging co-creation, by le leveraging visual thinking, we think you can be more successful at bringing that strategy to life. So this is really the core of what Explain does, and this is what we want to spend most of our time today talking about how for you to do this in a practical way. In real brief form, just a quick, uh, quick background on me. Uh, I'm Eric Wood, I'm the CEO of Explain. Um, my background, I have a classical strategy background with uh, an MBA from Harvard Business School and my first years in strategy consulting at Bain & Company. Uh, but that's not really the, the important part. The important part is that I've sat where you're sitting. Um, I've also worked inside of public companies. I've worked inside of small businesses, Explain being one of them. Um, I've worked inside of nonprofit organizations, as have most of the folks on our team. And so we are really trying to bring theory and practice together uh, and give you a positive formula that's been tested and, and tried in organizations of all sizes. Uh, and we've been there. We've done that. So that's, that's, that's important when you're, when you're um, trying to think about a, how to apply a theory is, what, has it worked someplace before? And we've seen this work. Um, lastly, before we dive into the content, if you want to join the discussion online, uh, there's information here in terms of how to follow us at, uh, on our Twitter page at Strategy Activation. Also, if you have not joined our newsletter, please text EXPRESS to 66866, and we'd love to have you on board. So let's kick off. Um, in the chat window, before we start, I'd love to understand a little bit about uh, the room and what your biggest question is today. So if you wouldn't mind, just take a quick second, type into the chat window some of your biggest questions, and we'll make sure that we craft some of our discussion today around your needs. How did design implement a lasting group dynamic? That's a great question. How do we actually make it stick? We'll definitely talk about that. How do you activate small strategies across larger enterprise strategies? That is a really, really good question. We all know that a, a one tactic is somebody else's strategy and so on and so forth. So nesting those together and making them work 
is critical. How do I ask the right questions in creating a customer journey map? We may or may not get into that today, but we will definitely get into that in the second webinar. Um, and we'll make sure we note that in case it does come up. How does culture inform strategy? I'll be talking about that all day. Uh, the key, key message there is that uh, strategy is a function of, of how do we get human beings to coordinate. So we're gonna talk a lot about culture. Uh, a lot of other great questions here. And so my team will be assembling some of these and we'll make sure we build some of these into the Q&A. Uh, and I'll try to make sure that we have uh, embedded it in the discussion. So why don't we dive into the content? Um, first, I'd like to start with talking about why strategy doesn't work. Um, both in my work as a strategy consultant, as well as in a lot of the research that's been done by a lot of experts, we know some really critical facts about bringing strategy to life. The first one is that most of it fails. Uh, we know that about $38 billion are spent annually on strategy consulting. Now that's not consulting in general, that's specifically hiring the Baines, McKinsey's, BCG's, insert strategy firm here to develop a corporate strategy to help an organization get from point A to point B. So it's really, that number is just a microset of the whole strategy spend. We also know that within that organization, you guys have all experienced this, multiples of that are spent in the organization, planning, executing, reworking that strategy when you add the internal time and expense. So we're taking the position that this is about a $400 billion problem that we need to solve. And we also know that about 80% of those corporate strategies fail. So it causes us to wonder, well, why is that? Why do we have such a terrible hit rate on success on this? And Explain has a couple points of view on this. Um, we believe that when you are deploying your strategy, when you've been involved in that strategy, when you've been engaged in developing it, you see the summit very clearly. What you see out there is this very clear path from point A to point B, and the expectation organizationally is that once we show everyone else the path, everyone's gonna to snap to it and jump to it. The reality, however, and I think this probably will resonate for some of you, what your team often sees is some picture that looks more like this. That clear summit is flagged off with, a, with the fog of confusion, with the clouds. I can't even see that summit necessarily. I don't see what you see in terms of where we're headed. I also see a lot of obstacles in my path. I got across the forest. I've got to cross the water. There's a dragon in there. And those dragon, that dragon really represents apathy. It represents risk. There's, there's real change required of humans to get from point A to point B. And if they don't know the path and they don't know what's in it for them, it feels like a risky strategy to get there. So ultimately, for a lot of organizations, strategy feels like mission impossible. And this is a key thing that we need to understand up, up front because we need to get humans to understand where they're headed, how they're gonna get there, and why they're gonna be safe along that journey. We boiled it down to sort of three reasons that we feel that strategies have failed overall. The first one is a lack of line of sight between people and that summit. How do we get people to see not only where they're going, but what their role is in it? So for me, an individual in this organization, I need to see how I ladder up into that entire, that entire vision and how we get there and see my role in it. The second thing that we have seen as a, as a critical challenge is just frankly a failure to invest in activation. We spend a lot of money on offsites, workshops, strategy consultants, uh, internal resources to develop this strategy. But then once that strategy is done, it often becomes shelfware. People don't actually spend even nearly a percentage, 10%, 5% of the same effort to actually bring that strategy into the organization and bring it to life. So that failure to invest in activation, whether it be in dollars or just time and attention is a critical failure. And the third one is the lack of employee engagement. How do we actually get this to be meaningful to the individuals that are involved and consider their needs in the process of deploying this? These are the three things that we want to focus on today and talk about some tools about how to overcome them. So let's talk about the first key concept. Um, with regard to that, that first issue, line of sight, we talk about this in terms of a navigation system. As humans, we have been navigating to far off destinations for as long as we can remember. And it's a journey, it's a process. Um, any journey that you take, whether it's your your holiday trip to another location, whether it's getting to work or whether it's a, a long-term strategy, you need to have a sense of where you're headed, 
how you're going to get there, and to your research plan and who's involved. And so the same is true in business. We feel that a good business structure, a good organizational structure will have a navigation system for the strategy that looks something like this. There's a clear mission or a purpose. There's a clear vision of where you're gonna go. There's a clear strategy about how you're gonna get from point A to point B. There's a roadmap along that route that's broken down in chunks that are digestible, that people can understand. And importantly, there's even a role map there that describes for each person in that process, what is their role? What is their part to play? So let's dive into this in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm gonna start with mission or purpose. Each organization that's represented here, I'm sure has a, a, a different language for this, but whether it's your mission, whether it's your purpose, whether it's your tr true North Star, ultimately most organizations exist for a reason and they exist to solve something. This is your compass. This is your, your North Star. This is the thing that your organization is solving for. And that is the thing that we need to use as the, as sort of the anchor for alignment. Just like Magnetic North, it's very, it's very atypical to see that your purpose or your mission in your organization is gonna change drastically in any given short period of time. The second element that we would wanna talk about is your vision. So your vision is a destination that you can see on the horizon. It's not always as durable as as your mission or your purpose. Sometimes your vision is, we're gonna get from this point to that next summit. And as soon as you get to that summit, all of a sudden you can see the next summit beyond. So your vision is really for some set period of time, where do we need to take this organization from point, point A to point B? In some organizations, it's a three-year vision. It's some organizations, it's a five. We've even worked with an organization that has a 20-year vision. Um, but this is sort of a critical idea of, this is a place that we want to get to out in the future. And then this is where strategy fits in. Strategy starts to put the planning against how are we going to get there. Your strategy is your path. It's your point A to point B. There's lots of ways to get to achieve that vision, but you need as an organization to commit to one and commit to a route that you're going to take your organization on. So this is your chosen strategy, your chosen route to get there. For a lot of organizations, this is where this work stops. For a lot of organizations, frankly, um, they have a strategy, but perhaps not a vision or not a purpose or a mission. Uh, and in most organizations that we see trouble, the three are not aligned. So key point right now is let's start aligning that. The next level down, however, to solve this line of, of sight problem we talked about is how do we start making it real for all of the individuals in the organization? For that, we need to go now below strategy and we need to start talking about a roadmap. What are, what are the segments? What are we gonna do on day one, day two, day three? How are we gonna break this up into digestible chunks? And how do we put that picture in front of folks so that they, although that vision seems far away, they can see that they can get to the next milestone. So that's the purpose of a roadmap in an organization. And then the other addition that we wanna, we wanna introduce today is the concept of a role map. A role map, translates for individuals what their part of this process is. What is their role? How do they support it? Every individual in an organization plays a part in that whole process, and we need to coordinate those actions. So role maps in an organization might translate into your annual goal setting. It might translate into your job description. It might translate into your performance management system. But collectively, the system that you use to get each individual in the organization aligned sums up to being the role map. And we need to make sure that role map matches up to everything else we've just talked about. So let's take a quick, uh, a quick poll. Um, we love to gather data from this amazing group we've collected and just kind of see what's happening in your organization. We'd like to ask you um, of these topics, of the mission and purpose, the vision, the strategy, the roadmap, the role map, which of the following are widely used in your company. It's multiple choice, you can pick one, you can pick many, but let's just get a quick pulse on who we've got in the room and what's happening in your companies. All right, we've got about almost 50% in, we'll give it another minute, see if we can get to a good quorum, but we're already starting to see it shape up. All right. 
Wow. Okay. Starting to look, starting to get a picture here. Isn't that interesting? So for those of you that haven't voted, uh, go ahead and keep voting and we're going to close the poll in about uh, 10 seconds. Okay, let's, let's end the poll. So let's show the results. So isn't this interesting? This is, um, this is about what we typically see when we talk to our customers and also from data that we've researched uh, in the organization. I think one thing that's really interesting to call out um, is that mission and purpose is now the dominant guiding force, at least among the organizations represented with this group. That, by the way, is a change from the past. Um, I think if we'd done the survey 10 years ago, uh, that would not have been the case, but I'm delighted to see that it is the case because I personally believe having a clear mission and having a clear purpose is really the most critical element of the navigation strategy. So that is a uh, navigation system. So that's great to see. Um, however, the rest of the numbers are about typical of what we've seen. Uh, for all of your organizations, only about two thirds of them have a, have a, a, dominant, a dominant and clear vision and strategy, for instance. Um, and as we would expect, after that, it trails off pretty dramatically. Um, once you get to strategy, you can see that what we're talking about with the line of sight problem, only 11% uh, of even the organizations represented in this call um, have the tools in place to really clearly align individual roles with the strategy, vision, and purpose. So this is a fascinating um, uh, just real-time validation, and thank you for sharing this. And this really helps to put a point on what we're talking about. So this is a navigation system. Um, I will close with that and we'll start to move on to the next topic. Um, before we do that, I want to do one more poll, which is as you look at um, the navigation system as a whole that we've talked about, how many of you, I'd like to understand, is your company aligned on their navigation system? And what I mean by that is, do you not only have these elements, but do you feel they're in alignment? So let's start with that poll. You guys didn't hesitate on voting on this one. That's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quick results. All right, we'll give you about five more seconds. Okay, so let's close that poll. We'll share it. And the, uh, not surprisingly, uh, this looks, again, sort of like that 80-20 rule. Uh, I would expect this group to be a slightly more enlightened group because you're, you're attending this webinar and you're curious and interested in this topic and how to make change. Uh, and still, we, we see that about 71% of the organizations represented here do not uh, feel that the company is aligned on the navigation system. Um, this is very, very typical. This is within about 5% of every time I've ever done this poll. So um, there's a big opportunity here. I think that's the exciting news. There's lots of opportunity to start to drive change um, simply by working on this first concept. How do we get that alignment in the organization? So let's talk about our second concept. Um, we've already talked about line of sight. Uh, the second reason that that uh, strategy activation fails in organizations, we talked about being the, the issue of how do we actually um, uh, engage uh, our, our teams to do this? How do we start to bring people forward and bring them up that activation curve uh, and invest in activation in a meaningful way? So the concept I'd like to in, in, uh, introduce right now is one that we call the activation curve. Um, the activation curve is a tool that really comes from, uh, this is sort of explains design, but it really is uh, coming from learning uh, studies and understanding how human beings learn and adapt to, new, to change and new information. And what we see, if you recall that um, we were talking when we were talking about investing in activation about how most companies um, develop that strategy, maybe introduce it in a town hall meeting, maybe send it out to the entire company, maybe there's a cascade through leadership, but that's usually where it stops. 
Well, that's really only the first starting point on the activation curve. The first phase of the activation curve that we want to talk about, we call hear it. This is the communication phase. And this is the where we need to get the organization to be aware of the change that's happening, understand what it is, why it is, why we're doing it, um, and get to that point of acceptance. And critically, that point of acceptance doesn't mean that they're totally bought in. It means that the people in the system are accepting that the change is going to happen and willing to go to that next step to learn more. The second phase then is a learning phase that we call believe it. This is the point where those, for those people that get to the acceptance phase, they have begun to and are willing to start to acquire some new skills. They're starting to apply them in the work. And based on the feedback loops that are happening as they're acquiring, applying new behaviors, new tools, new techniques, they begin to internalize the change and they're understanding what's working and what's not and answering the question for themselves, is this better than it was yesterday? So that phase is really critical to set up the final phase, which we call the live it phase. And this is when you're really embedding your activation into the organization. This is the point at which you start to look at the organization and see that this is actually the new business as usual and it's worked. So this is our goal. This is our destination. This is the place where we start to see that the new ways of work are being integrated, that this is truly the, the new business as usual for our, for our organization. And we're importantly starting to look into the future and start thinking about the next change we're going to take. So this is what we mean when we say um, investing in ad activation uh, is one of the biggest challenges to strategy activation, the organization's investment in it. It's not just about money, it's about thinking and designing a solution and a deployment and a launch plan of your strategy that actually solves the problem of how do we get people up this curve? How do we not only make them aware, but how do we get them to that phase where they're learning it, they're embedding it, they're internalizing it? So that is a, that is a sort of critical part of key concept two. Um, as we jump into the how we do this, I'd like to take one last poll and just have folks in this organization chart where, or on this call, chart where your organization is currently on the activation curve. For the major change that you're interested in today or the change that's happening in your organization, where are you guys at? Is your organization at the awareness phase? Are they at the acceptance phase? Are they actively internalizing this? Um, just give us a quick sense of, of what's represented on the, on the call today. All right, we've got uh, maybe about 15, 20 seconds more. I love getting this data real time, by the way. It's just so, uh, it's so wonderful to, we have a saying that the smartest person in the room is the room. And so the opportunity nowadays to be able to collect the room's knowledge in one place very quickly like this is a pretty powerful tool for all of us. All right, so why don't we go ahead and uh, freeze the poll and we'll share back what we see. So isn't that interesting? Um, and again, this is, this is pretty typical. Um, we've got the majority of the organization or the plurality of, of the folks on the call today are sort of in the awareness understanding phase, um, you know, with, with roughly about half, uh, half represented in those two categories. And then it trails off from there. Um, we've got pretty low representation for, for internalizing and integrating. Uh, and there's a bunch of folks in the learning phase, which is great. So, um, again, this is, you know, and this might be a, a function of, of where your particular organization is in, in moving forward. But overall, over time, what we want to see is that people are flowing through this process and that we're mindful about making that happen. And frankly, a lot of the investment is in that middle. Uh, a lot of the investment has to ha happen in terms of um, aiding the humans in our system to start to acquire and apply and internalize new behaviors. Um, those new behaviors are representative of change and growth. And that's really, I think, probably the biggest lack in the activation curve is, is organizations making a commitment to recognize that and invest in that. So. Let's jump to our last key concept. Uh, we talked about employee engagement being the third of the principal reasons that, that strategies fail. Um, 
This one's probably pretty intuitive for you to understand, but I want to put some numbers to it. And this is what we typically actually see. Um, like all things, it's kind of an 80-20 rule. When you roll anything out new, you're going to get a bunch of folks in your organization, uh, a bunch being maybe 20%, maybe less, that are willing to just jump right on board. These are the folks that say, sure, I'll do that. I can see why. I can see that this is good for me. And I can see why we'll be better off as an organization if we do this. So these are the, the early adopters in your organization who have a, a high degree of trust and loyalty um, and a willingness to be engaged in driving this change. We also know that there's about 20% on the other side. Uh, these are the folks with the crossed arms that are sort of in the, no way, not doing this. Uh, why should I change? Uh, there's too much risk in this for me. You know, this, this is risking the job that I know and I, I don't want to see it. Um, and most often we also hear, or often we hear, um, management just doesn't get it. They're not on the ground. They're not doing this every day. They don't understand what's really happening here. And this, this is coming from the ivory tower. So this group is a really hard group to work with. Um, it, but you can see why it would take a great investment in that understanding portion and acceptance portion to even get them to uncross their arms and engage in the process. This group is not the challenge, however. Um, the key opportunity for all of us change makers that are on this call today is this middle group. This middle group are the fence sitters. These are the folks that are maybe saying sure to your face, but they're thinking, mm, no way. Um, either I don't understand it, I don't see what the benefit for me is in this thing. Um, and most likely this is the group that'll, that thinks, okay, this will pass. This is the flavor of the month. This is gonna go by. I'm just gonna stand back and let it blow by, but not participate, not engage. This 60% of your organization is what most of this work is focused on. This 60% makes all, all the difference between being on the 20 side or the 80 side of this equation. If we can get this 60% or a big portion of them to move off the fence, by helping them understand, by helping them see the benefit for them, and for supporting their growth, we can get them over to the other side so that we are actually part of that group that has the majority of the organization aligned. I would advise that this is where you want to put most of your focus. That other 20% in the no way bucket, that's, that's hard work. That's a heavy lift. But this group is actually the group that is at least open to change. And if you follow the activation curve, we're going to get them, we're going to get them up the curve. So let's talk a little bit about engagement. I want to transition the conversation now from what are the problems and what are some of the key concepts to what are some of the new tools that you can start applying in your work today. Um, I'd love to see folks leave this webinar uh, with a couple of notes and things that you want to try and do differently in your organization and, and lead the change from the front. So to, to talk about engagement, what I'd like to do is first sort of set up a contrast of the old way of thinking about change management and then some of the new new principles we want to introduce. We think that in addition to the good navigation system that we talked about and the commitment to actually investing in getting people off the activation curve, the way that we actually start to engage, drive that employee engagement um, is going to come from some of these principles. In the old school and the one that I was trained in, um, we were talking about terms like change management, getting uh, driving adoption, cascading information. Uh, forcing stakeholder buy-in. So even these terms, if you listen to them, um, are very hierarchical. Uh, it very much comes from the traditional last mid-century model of management, uh, which was a very hierarchical organization. Um, that is not the way we work today. Uh, while some companies still have that model, uh, because we have moved into a new realm where creativity and innovation is tantamount to success, we're in organizations that are not hierarchical, are not structured in this way, and we need to actually have a new way and a new set of approaches to get there. We see this new school looking more like this. Uh, change man it's not change management anymore. Now we're talking about setting a vision and getting people aligned to it. Do we have a common purpose? Do we have a common vision? Are we all engaged in this desire to move towards that, that greater future? And as leaders, it's critical for all of us to start thinking about how do we frame what we're trying to change in terms of setting a vision for folks rather than managing the change. This requires us to get stakeholders engaged in the process, not just bought in. We have to actually engage them in the change process so they can get their fingerprints on it. 
We want to see authentic participation from folks across the organization to make this happen. We probably want to co-create a lot of the, the stuff that happens on the ground so that people have their fingerprints all over it. And we need to do a lot more investment in how do we identify those bright spots and those opportunities and celebrate them so that we're building momentum in the organization. Lastly, instead of following a process, the seven steps of this or the six steps of that, we want to act actually think about how do we design this from principles. So principles are much more malleable. Principles give you the opportunity to actually adopt them to your organization in an authentic way. Uh, and the reality is one size doesn't fit all. So we'd like to give you actually a bucket of principles that you can think about and pick the ones that are going to create the most leverage in your organization and the most opportunity. So let's talk about those eight principles. And this is where we'll spend the, the, the remainder of the webinar. Um, we have eight principles that we have utilized in our work uh, and we have seen work among our peers and other organizations that have been successful uh, that ultimately start to speak to that new change model, that new approach for driving employee engagement. The first one is co-creation. And this is the one that honestly I put first for a reason. Um, ultimately, people support what they create. So the most simple thing I can say is if you take one thing away from this, or this, this meeting today, it's don't take your strategy and throw it over the wall and expect it to take off. That doesn't work anymore. What we need to do is, as leaders, set the vision of where we're going, but get the stakeholders, the influencers, the people that are impacted by it involved in that solution. This helps us get from that person that says management doesn't get it to the person that says management doesn't get it, but you're inviting me to the process. Great. I'll give you my voice. So co-creation is the process of bringing in the key stakeholders, the audiences that are affected, and actually benefiting from the knowledge that they have and getting them involved in the process. And when you invite them to develop the blueprint, when you invite them to develop the plan, or when you invite them to develop and build upon the plan that exists, all of a sudden it's their plan. And they feel like they have a sense of ownership of it, and they have instantly converted from being opposed to it, being one of those backbenchers, to being somebody who's engaged in it and is moving forward. And I've seen over the course of 25 years of my work, it's better. The plan is infinitely better because the reality is, as leaders, oftentimes we don't know everything that's happening on the ground. And some of the best ideas in the room are in other people's hands and heads. So getting them involved is usually going to elevate the level of work. The second topic, uh, the second principle is the idea of investing in activation. So we talked a lot about the activation curve. Um, this is really about building an activation plan. So how do we actually look at that curve, understand that we need to get people through the understanding phase, the acceptance phase, through and into trying new things, trying new ways of work, and ultimately getting them to the place where it's embedded. We don't wanna make the mistake that humans are gonna just snap to new information. We wanna be mindful about the fact that we need to aid and assist that process. So for every organization, we encourage you to think about an investment in an activation plan. Um, and this doesn't have to be a huge complex effort, but it does require that you understand who are your key audiences, what are the steps that we need to get them through, what are the gaps in knowledge, understanding, or skills that we need to address, and what are we gonna do about it? And so, very simply, this is a model that you can download from, um, uh, from our website. We'll share this out with you for the folks that are on this call. Um, but a simple example of an activation plan looks something like this. Identify your key stakeholders on one axis. Identify what activities need to be get done on what time frame to bring people up the, the activation curve. And then what are the specific interventions you're going to introduce at each of those stages? What is the training thing that we're going to do for our, our managers? What is the awareness thing that we need to do to get the, you know, all of our teams up to speed on what we're asking of them? Um, all of these elements collectively become an activation plan. And it can be as simple, it doesn't have to be terribly complex, but it does actually have to be comprehensive. The last thing on this activation principle that I want to share is that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Clearly, if you were to map the activation curve like we did in the poll across your stakeholder groups, it's likely your leadership team is pretty high up the curve today. And it's likely that the farther you get from the leadership team, the lower they are on the activation curve. So the rate at which you roll this out in your launch plan actually is dependent on which audience you're talking about. And so in reality, you're actually thinking about how do we activate each group 
according to their needs and where they're at in this process. To that point, and to kind of build on that, um, the third point is, is a classic uh, pillar of design thinking, which is empathy. It's really critical that as you start to think about those stakeholder groups, that we are thinking about those stakeholder groups as individual groups with individual needs. And so the need of your people manager might be different than the need of your customer field rep, for instance. Um, let's understand who are those key audiences that need to be on board, move up this activation curve. What are their individual needs? What, what is each of these individuals, um, uh, what are they feeling? What are they seeing? What do they, uh, what's in it for them? You know, why, why is there a compelling reason for them to engage in this process? We need to actually de-risk the situation for them. So we need to understand what do they fear? Um, and with that knowledge, we can ultimately understand, all right, for them to get from where they're at today to taking the actions that orga the organization needs of them, if we answer these two or three key questions for them in this awareness and understanding stage, how do we get them to the acceptance phase so they're willing to move forward? And then once they get there, what are the tools they need to start to acquire and develop new skills? So empathy is a critical element of this process and making sure that you're thinking about your key audiences, not as one company I'm gonna deploy this plan to, but as individuals who have different needs, critical to this, this change. The fourth principle we'd like to share is the idea of visualizing the navigation system. So we wouldn't be explained uh, who trademarked the visual thinking company if we didn't believe this truly in our heart because we've seen it work. At the end of the day, the reason we draw things on napkins, for instance, when we're trying to share a concept is that it helps generate alignment very quickly. And honestly, if your strategy isn't clear enough that you can't draw a picture of it, it's probably not clear enough. So we very much endorse the concept of visualizing all those key elements of your navigation system. How do you actually put into your lobby the picture of the vision and the mission for this company so that every day your employees walk in and see it, as do your customers, as do your partners, driving alignment in real time. There's no reason you can't do the same thing with your, your strategy. There's no reason you can't do the same thing with your job descriptions. The point being, if you can visualize this so that you have a common picture in everyone's mind, you're gonna get there a lot faster than a wordy three ring binder of strategy. So try to boil it down to something that's visual. And if you can visualize the navigation system, you'll be more successful. The other thing that um, often breaks up uh, these, these processes and is very easily solved is to systemize these linkages. So what I mean by that, is that um, this principle is about the idea that it all needs to hang together. Just like that navigation system we talked about has to be aligned, you also has, have to align the other parts of the organization that feed into the execution of your strategy. A, does your vision match your strategy? Does your strategy actually solve for getting to that vision? B, does your budget, for instance, actually align with that strategy? Are you actually budgeting and funding the things that have to happen for the strategy to be executed? Does that tie to your personnel stuff? Does that tie to your goals? Does that tie to um, individual performance management? Um, are you actually attaching your measurement system to the strategy or is it measuring the old goals that you had last year? So the point with this one is very simply, look across your organization from a design mindset and make sure that the system design hangs together. Make sure that all the elements that could potentially create conflict are in alignment and you'll be much more successful. The sixth one is um, around specific tools to engage employees. Um, and on this one, my headline is simply, why can't we have fun in business? Um, it's kind of interesting for us to see um, how few organizations are really creating highly engaging tools to get employees to rehearse new ways of work. Um, we oftentimes do in learning and development, we do a lot of training. We take people through a lot of what I would frankly think of as PowerPoint slide whipping, lots of decks about ways to do things. But there's ways to elevate employee engagement um, in the learning environment. Um, one example that we're showing here are, um, have you thought about using games um, to make, make new learning more engaging? Wonderful thing about games is that they allow people to rehearse new behaviors in a risk-free environment and learn very quickly. So um, you can do this yourselves. You can do this through making um, your 
deployments of strategy and why we're doing this, um, a, a role playing seminar, it can be a workshop, it can be something that gets teams together in small teams to maybe fill out a canvas and talk about as a team, as a group, well, if we do this change, what's it mean for our team and how we work? What are the pluses? What are the negatives? What are the things we need to mitigate? Um, it doesn't have to be terribly complex, but the simple idea is bring some design thinking tools into the change process to actually engage your employees in a way that is getting them around the table really involved in the process so that they can actually envision with you, co-create with you, and rehearse new ways of work with you uh, in a more fun and engaging way. Um, this isn't just sort of a, a, a soft desire. We also know from, from a lot of study and measurement that when you integrate words, pictures, role play, and games, the amount of retention and understanding and of people's ability to move to action dramatically increases. So there's a lot of science behind this. Seventh, uh, we would like to talk about embedding it in your organizational DNA. You have so many opportunities in your organization to build in reminder systems for the strategy, the roadmap, and the role map that you're trying to drive. People have lots of, of, of places where they gather, meeting places, the water, water cooler, community areas, play areas. Um, people have various signposts and flagpoles around the country, or around the, the company rather. How do you actually hang the flag on those those posts? How do you actually use those spaces in a way that's constantly reinforcing with environmental reminders where you're trying to go? Um, this is a picture of a uh, client here locally uh, in Portland, OMSI, who, who in a hallway that most of their employees walk through have put their 20-year vision, their five-year strategy, their specific initiatives that they're working quarter by quarter right down to who owns them and where are they at in the process out into the world for everyone to see. And this has allowed them to really embed it in their organizational way of work. They literally walk through that hallway every day. They're commenting on that blackboard behind uh, that you see in the picture um, about the current state of what's happening. They're exchanging feedback on what's working, what's not, and how to make it better. But the bottom line is everywhere you walk through that organization and lots of other folks that we've worked with that have been successful, you're constantly reminded post-launch of the strategy of what is the strategy, how do we plan to get there, what's working, what's not, and what's your feedback. So find those mile or those, those, those signposts, find those flagpoles, figure out in your organization where you can start to embed this information in the meeting places, and just make sure that there's a constant dialogue and conversation happening. And then lastly, um, we are strong advocates for avoiding shelfware. Um, We've all seen those three reminders of strategy that get put on the shelf and never touched again. The reality is when you make a plan, um, as they say in the military, no plan is going to survive first contact. You're not going to see a, a, uh, a plan that anticipates every change that's going to hit the organization. Just like a sailboat sailing on a straight line on the, on the path of the, uh, of the map, ultimately a storm's going to come up and blow it aside. You're going to have to navigate around something else. Course corrections are always having to be made. So we also encourage you to think about your activation program in a way that allows change to occur naturally. Um, you know, maybe that these initiatives have a one-year goal, but you're tracking them on a weekly or a quarterly basis, and you're building a feedback loop in with the team that's doing it to say what's working, what's not, and how do we make it better? Think of the ways that are appropriate for your organization to make it agile enough that you can both accommodate change, which is inevitable, and have your organization sharing through feedback what's working and what's not, and how to actually course correct real time with the involvement of the team involved so that you can be successful. So that sort of wraps up the, the content for the day. Um, just to sort of close on some of the key concepts, we believe that strategies fail for three reasons. There's no line of sight between people and mission, and for that, we counsel you to think about build yourself a navigation system. Make sure that you've got an aligned vision strategy and below that a roadmap, role maps, so that everyone in the organization is aligned and can see where they're going. Make sure secondly that you overcome the failure to invest in activation by actually putting in some percentage of the work that you did developing the strategy and thinking about how do you activate it in your organization. How are we now going to 
get people off the activation curve so they're not only hearing and understanding it, but we're equipping them with the tools to in, engage them in behavior change and we're helping to embed it. And lastly, how do we get through the lack of employee engagement problem by starting to apply the eight principles of employee engagement in the process? How do we start to take these eight principles that we've shared and pick and choose the ones that are gonna work for your organization? They're not all a blanket recommendation, it's not a process, but there's a lot of rich material in there that you can think about applying in your organization that's gonna help you get there much faster. And if we do that and we're adaptive and we address these three things, we're gonna be infinitely more successful in our change program. So in closing, and then I'm gonna use the last few minutes for those of you that wanna hang on and ask some questions, um, we'll, we'll do that next. Um, but for those of you that are not able to, to join us for the Q&A, um, make sure we're thinking about navigating, engaging, and activating. Um, in terms of next steps and things that, that are available to you to sort of support this, uh, we have a couple of things. First and foremost, uh, the next webinar that we're gonna hold, second in this series, is actually gonna get beyond the theory and actually right down into tools and, and practice. So we're gonna start talking about how to build an activation plan and provide you with the template to do that. We're gonna share some exercises for empathy. We're gonna share a bunch of other um, ideas that you can take into your organization in a very practical way and start putting the stuff to work for you. So if you're curious about that next step, uh, please sign up for the February 7th webinar and it's gonna be very much a working session together. Secondly, um, we do have a lot of these tools uh, available for download. Uh, if you go to www.explain.com, uh, there's a section called Studio X where we've made a lot of the tools, the canvases, the exercises that we use, and we've also seen work with our, our peers and clients available to you. So please just, just download them and take them, um, as well as some thought leadership on explain.com itself that, uh, that speaks in more depth about some of the things we talked about today. So with that, um, I'd love to hear some of the questions that are in the room. Um, we do have a Q&A feature in Zoom. So if you put uh, your question into there, uh, if you haven't seen the question, just type your question in there. If somebody else has asked the same question that, that, uh, that you were about to, just vote on that one and that'll bring that one to the top. And we'll take about uh, five or 10 minutes to do some, some Q&A. So got a couple, couple right out of the gates. Um, how do you help very large enterprise clients unify their strategies across silos and functional areas? This is a great question. The bigger the beast, the more difficult it is, right? Um, and somebody at the beginning had asked the question um, in reverse, which is in a big organization, how do you do this at a small scale for a small group? Um, I think of this whole process like nesting dolls. If, 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 we, if we know the metaphor of the nesting doll where the larger one is inside the smaller one, this process works at any scale. Um, we've worked this, this process with small nonprofits with as few as 10 people. Um, all the way up to a deployment across 65,000 employees in uh, pretty much every country of the world. Um, and the, the key thing is really to understand how do you actually get the highest level strategy aligned? And this is the important part with enterprise clients. You've got to make sure that we're starting with the overall strategy as the trunk of the tree. And then understand how to translate that down into each of the branches of the tree. So, for example, in a large enterprise client, um, let's say that has five geographies, what we've seen work very successfully is to get alignment at the core of the enterprise on what is absolutely core to the enterprise from a strategy perspective, and where is their latitude for um, adapting it on the periphery uh, and tailoring it. And then working with each of those, let's say five geos to understand, okay, let's interpret the strategy now for what it means for us. This 60% of it has to be aligned with the enterprise. This 40% of it, we have the freedom to actually adapt. And let's now make sure that every employee, every human in our system is very clear on how that all aligns. So um, there's a lot to unpack here, but I would simply say, think of it as a series evolving from the tree, from the main trunk, and understanding how do you actually get each successive step moving away aligned to the core, but tailored at the individual level, tailored at the team level, tailored at the group level for the reality in their world? We're not gonna do the same thing in the Asian market that we're doing in the European market. What's different? Why is it different? 
and is it still aligned? It's not so much about telling people what to do, it's about removing the things that are obstacles, uh, the things that are gonna be discordant with the whole. So happy to talk offline about this in much more detail and share kind of how we've done this with large companies. Um, another question, in your experience, what makes executive level stakeholders resistant to seeing a strategy through? That is a great question. Um, the biggest single one is that they didn't have their hands on the strategy itself. Uh, I saw this firsthand as a strategy consultant, where at the executive level, even in an old school, more hierarchical structure, um, if the strategy creation process is not inclusive of the executives um, and broadly of stakeholders at large, it's likely to fail. Uh, this is the, the, the issue that as consultants we've all seen of, you know, the consultants throwing the thing over the wall and it dying on the vine because there's not executive buy it. So co-creation is the answer to this question. How do we actually find out who are the key stakeholders that are gonna be necessary to bring this into life? And how do we get them involved in the process so that they have their fingerprints on the solution and then feel a sense of ownership of it? If they don't have that ownership, they're probably not going to actually engage in supporting that solution. Um, let's see what else we've got coming up. How do I bring a slow and archaic public service organization round to this way of thinking? That is an awesome question. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on that one because it gets us out of the corporate world and into the world of, of uh, governmental organizations, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, this is an area where we advise uh, something we call ambassador programs. Um, it's, it is really hard to drive change uh, uh, in a more bureaucratic organization. Um, one of the benefits though that we have in human-centered organizations, which are all of them, is that the power actually resides in small pockets all over the organization. And if you can identify four or five, eight or 10, 20 or 30 um, thought leaders who are on board with this idea of change and are willing to start making small experiments in their teams, trying new ways of work in small pockets, groups of five, groups of 10, and then demonstrating through their success that this is a better way of work, you can bypass the formality of rolling that out because it becomes a snowball effect of its own. We've seen this working, um, I, can, I can say I've seen this working everywhere from uh, actually military organizations uh, of the US government we've worked with at the Department of Defense, um, all the way to municipal organizations, um, cities, counties, et cetera, where a handful of individuals said, you know, I wanna try a different way of doing this. And they've experimented with and then built networks of change agents internally and the change came from within. Because at the end of the day, it's hard to argue with results. So um, I know that sounds a little sub subversive, but it's just the reality of how we work. If people are showing us new ways of work and we're seeing that it's effective, it really lowers the level of resistance to change. So let's see. Lastly, let's talk about um, how we design strategy that can be nimble and evolve with an unpredictable landscape. Uh, I think we're gonna close with that one. Um, this is, goes back to that, that agile topic. Um, and agile is a buzzword, but what, what we're really talking about is how do you adapt? Uh, and I'm gonna go back to that idea of a journey. Um, if you're on a journey, you're on a car trip with your family and you plan to go from point A to point B, but something comes up, either somebody needs to go get food or there's a great site over there that you want to go and divert from your plan, that's going to happen. Um, ultimately, the way that you can be sex successful in making that happen is building agility into your plan. And so we, for instance, um, have executed strategy in, a, uh, in, in this way with some clients where we've said, let's get really clear on the destination. Let's get really clear, for instance, on the four sort of strategy lanes that we're going to take to get there. Let's get clear about the roadmap that's gonna happen, but then let's actually start to track that and break that down into small segments. What is the sprint? And this is maybe the emphasis word for this, this uh, answer to this question. What is the sprint that's gonna get us closer to the destination that we can see? Let's do that and then let's stop and reassess. Then to do the next sprint based on new information. 
So the idea I think is very simply, can you find a way in your strategy activation to break it down into smaller and smaller parts that you can be, sh be sure to be successful at and give your teams the license to do things in small sprints. This is something we're taking from design thinking. A sprint gives you the opportunity to work in a burst, only drive as far as you can see on the horizon line. And then when you get to that spot, ascertain the terrain ahead and figure out where to go next. As long as you have two things, one, clarity in terms of where you're headed, and two, clarity in terms of what you're gonna do in this next short period, you can course correct your way to that destination in a much more agile way than the way we used to do it, where we said, you've got a 12 month plan, you're gonna go do this, and it doesn't account for the fact that the world changes as we go. So think about introducing sprints into the way that you work, and think about introducing sprints into and give people permission to do the work in smaller chunks to get to that end destination, and you'll probably be more successful than the old way we did it. So with that, I'm gonna close. Um, I wanna thank you all. This has been uh, delightful to have such incredible representation from so many different corners of the world. And we always learn something from you when we're doing this. So I've loved the feedback. Thank you for participating in the, the polls. Um, and I really would love to see you uh, in January at the next session on putting this to practical use. I think a lot of the remaining questions are around um, what are the tools that we can make to have, to have this happen? So we're gonna share some of those out for you. Um, most, of, most of all, I thank you guys for making change in the world. Uh, it's really critical to have uh, people like you doing the work that you're doing to, uh, to drive change and, and make this place better and make us all more successful and raise our quality of life and consciousness. So many thank yous to all of you and we hope to see you again. Cheers. Thank you.